Hello students, in this session, let's do rapid revision of gynecology so that this will be helpful for you, those who are giving their FMG exam in August or September. In this session, I will be mainly concentrating on high yield topics and repeated questions from the previous exams. I'm not going to discuss in detail, but I will be discussing all the important MCQs from different different topics. Now let's start the topic from the amenorrhea and puberty. Now in this topic, let's do the important MCQs. Now let's start. Most common cause of cryptomenorrhea. What does it mean by cryptomenorrhea guys? In the name itself it's there. It's a crypto. Crypto means a hidden. Menorrhea means menses. It's a hidden menses. What does it mean by hidden menses? This female is having her menses, but they are not coming out. They are getting hidden might be because of an obstruction to the outflow tract. So, there are different causes of cryptomenorrhea. What are the different causes of cryptomenorrhea? For example, imperforated hymen or cervical stenosis, vaginal atresia or transverse vaginal septum. These all can cause a cryptomenorrhea. But the most common cause of, out of all these, what is the most common cause? The most common cause of cryptomenorrhea is imperforate. imperforate hymen okay so imperforate hymen is the most common cause of cryptomenorrhea now this female is having this cryptomenorrhea so how we are going to treat this condition so treatment of imperforate hymen is cruciate cruciate incision so we are going to give an incision so that the menses, whatever is happening, they will come out. Okay, they are no longer hidden. So, cruciate incision, very important MCQ, is the treatment given for the imperforate hymen. Now, transverse vaginal septum. So, what do we mean by transverse vaginal septum? Guys, from the topic of embryology, we have already discussed that the vagina, this hollow tube, it is formed by the fusion of the derivative of a Mullerian duct and the urogenital sinus. Let me be more clear. Vagina, the upper two-third part, the upper two-third of the vagina, which is a derivative of Mullerian duct. So, the upper two-third of the vagina and the lower one-third of vagina. The lower one-third of vagina is a derivative of urogenital sinus. So, they have to fuse. Okay, they have to properly fuse and they have to make a hollow tube-like structure, which is vagina. But if there is a defect in the fusion, in this fusion process, that will result in transverse vaginal septum. So first important MCQ they will ask. Transverse vaginal septum is due to vertical fusion defects. So in the embryology of female reproductive tract, we'll be mainly dealing about the vertical fusion defects and lateral fusion defects. So, this transverse vaginal septum is a, a vertical fusion defect. Okay, very, very important MCQ. Transverse vaginal septum, okay, let me write it here, is a vertical fusion defect. Okay, due to non fusion of or defective fusion of. Upper two-third of vagina, which is upper two-third of vagina, is Mullerian duct in derivative. The Mullerian ducts are going to form the upper two-third of vagina. So it's a defect due to a defective fusion of upper two-third of vagina and lower one-third of vagina. Okay, which is urogenital sinus in origin. Clear? Now so, what is the treatment of this transverse vaginal septum? If there is this transverse vaginal septum, again the patient is going to present to our clinic with the chief complaint of primary amenorrhea, which is a cryptomenorrhea. Okay? She is not going to have her menses. Why? Because there is an obstruction, transverse vaginal septum. So, that she is going to present to our clinic with a complaint of amenorrhea. She is not having her menses. Now, so treatment is 
सेप्टल रिसेक्शन ओके वी आर गोइंग टू टेक आउट दैट सेप्टम सो वे डू वी हैव दिस सेप्टम सी यूजली द वेजेना इज डिवाइड इंटू थ्री पार्ट अपर वन थर्ड मिडिल वन थर्ड एंड लोअर वन थर्ड मोस्ट ऑफ द टाइम दिस सेप्टम इज प्रेजेंट इन द अपर वन थर्ड ऑफ वेजेना एट द लेवल ऑफ एक्सटर्नल लॉस द सर्विकल लॉस नाउ द मोस्ट कॉमन पोजिशन ऑफ दिस ट्रांसफर्स वेजेनल सेप्टम इज अपर वन थर्ड एट एक्सटर्नल आस important mcq now let's continue guys this is a very very favorite topic for the examiner that is turner syndrome first of all this turner syndrome is going to happen in a male or female in a female so what is the chromosomal abnormality the chromosomal abnormality is 45 x 0 usually a female is going to have a 46 double x 46 chromosomes out of that two are x chromosomes now here in this condition there is no y chromosome so definitely it's a female now out of the two x chromosomes one x chromosome is lost so 45 x 0 is the turner syndrome a turner female now after this a very important mcq which is keep on repeatedly asked is that a normal female out of the two x chromosomes because of a process known as lineization one x chromosome is going to be randomly inactivated now in this condition there are no two x chromosomes only one x chromosome is there so that do you think inactivation happens no so in this condition there is no bar body in a normal female bar body will be there but here there is no bar body or absence of bar body is seen in turner syndrome a very very important mcq after this how a female with turner syndrome is going to present to us to our clinics question then these are the keywords to identify that so a turner female she will be short statured with broad web neck will be seen okay web neck what about the chest she will be having a shield like chest okay shield like chest with widely spaced nipples shield like chest with widely spaced nipples okay now what about her gonads if you do ultrasonography on ultrasonography her gonads will be very very streaky a thin sliver of tissue will be a present why because there is a hypogonadism in this a female okay let's keep it apart now let's go with the physical characteristics now she is a short stature a web neck shield like chest with widely spaced nipples and she will be having sometimes a cubitus valgus short fourth metacarpal short fourth metacarpal okay next she might be having micrognathia okay so all these are a key points micrognathia short fourth metacarpal okay cubitus valgus widely spaced nipples okay on ultrasonography on ultrasonography on usg findings now she is having a streaky gonads okay now one more important point i want to emphasize here now she is having a thin sliver of gonads a streaky gonads so if she is having such kind of gonads now will you think that she is going to have her uh, normal periods or will she is going to have her normal offspring like you know childbirth usually no what i want to emphasize here is that this turner syndrome is an example of 
ഹൈപ്പർ ഗൊനാഡോട്രോപ്പിക് ഹൈപ്പോഗൊനൈഡിസം ഓക്കെ സോ ദർ ഈസ് നോ പ്രോബ്ലം വിത്ത് പിറ്റുട്ടറി ആക്സിസ് ബട്ട് ദ മെയിൻ പ്രോബ്ലം ലൈസ് എറ്റ് ദ ലെവൽ ഓഫ് ഗൊനാഡ്സ് ദ മെയിൻ ഗൊനാഡ്സ് ഇറ്റ് സെൽഫ് ദർ ഈസ് പ്രോബ്ലം സോ ഹിയർ ദ ഗൊനാഡ്സ് ദ മെയിൻ ഗൊനാഡ്സ് വിച്ച് ആർ ഓവറീസ് ദീസ് ഗൊനാഡ്സ് ആർ നോട്ട് പ്രോപ്പർലി ഫോം so main problem lies at the level of gonads so this is example of hypergonadotropic hyper gonadotropic hypo gonadism why it is hypergonadotropic hypergonadotropic means her pituitary her hypothalamus both are functioning normally so they are producing gnrh they are producing fsh and lh even in nor no, even not in normal amounts they are producing in very high amounts why because the ovaries are not properly formed so that there is very less estrogen so that there is no negative feedback so that hypothalamus pituitary they are trying to stimulate but at the main level of the gonads there is problem so it is hypogonadism but hypergonadotropic gonadotropic gonadotropic hormones are more now this is also a very very important mcq after this after knowing this what else you have to keep in mind regarding a turner syndrome now they will ask you this turn of female in this term turn of female what's the most common a cardiac abnormality cardiac abnormality so the most common cardiac abnormality in turn of female is repeatedly asked mcq coarctation of aorta coarctation of aorta is the most common cardiac abnormality now after seeing about the turner syndrome everything about the turner syndrome clinically completed now let's discuss about sheehan syndrome in sheehan syndrome what actually happens there is a necrosis of a pituitary gland it is postpartum postpartum necrosis of pituitary gland okay postpartum necrosis of pituitary gland so what actually happens guys during a pregnancy there is increase in the size of your pituitary gland now in some females after the delivery of the baby postpartum if there is too much postpartum hemorrhage if there is too much bleeding what happens the blood vessels will undergo vasoconstriction so vasospasm vasoconstriction will occur bleeding vasoconstriction in such cases there is also vasoconstriction of the blood vessels which are supplying the pituitary gland but pituitary gland is demanding more blood why because its mass is increased during pregnancy postpartum there is vasoconstriction so what actually happens there is a decrease blood flow to the pituitary gland such decrease blood flow will cause ischemia hypoxia and necrosis of the pituitary gland so this is postpartum after the delivery of baby necrosis is happening to the pituitary gland because of vasoconstriction or vasospasm so this is sheehan syndrome postpartum necrosis of pituitary gland due to vaso spasm okay now what you have to keep in mind in sheehan syndrome see there is total destruction total necrosis of the pituitary gland usually the pituitary gland the anterior pituitary will make what hormone guys anterior pituitary will make growth hormone prolactin thyroid stimulating hormone acth adrenocorticotropic releasing hormone and gonadotropic hormones like fsh lh now if there is postpartum necrosis of the pituitary gland what happened to all these hormone levels all these hormone levels all pituitary hormones 
hormones are decreased okay so all the pituitary hormone levels are decreased that is decreased gh decreased prolactin decreased acth decreased tsh and decreased fshlh so in a clinical question in a clinical point of view if they are asking a clinical question in fmg exam how they are going to ask a female having postpartum bleeding too much postpartum bleeding okay well and good after that what happened now this female is presented to the clinic with a failure of lactation usually a female after giving birth what she should have she should have a lactation normal female should have lactation because of prolactin but in this female because of the necrosis of pituitary gland there is absence of prolactin so she is not going to lactate now this female presented to the clinic with failure of lactation okay so failure of lactation is there along with that usually after the pregnancy there is amenorrhea but after sometimes there is normal menses happening but for this female do you expect that she will have her normal menses after some time usually no why because for normal menses and all you need to have the gonadotropin hormones fsh lh okay but in this females because of the necrosis of the pituitary gland she is not going to make fsh lh so she is going to the present to the clinic with also the complaint of amenorrhea so amenorrhea amenorrhea and failure of lactation if you are seeing this both these conditions in a question after the delivery of the baby then they will be most of the time asking about shehan's syndrome okay so please concentrate amenorrhea with the lactation failure this is nothing but shehan's syndrome now let's go to the other clinical condition which is kalman syndrome kalman syndrome now what exactly is kalman syndrome in kalman syndrome there is a failure of migration of a gonadotropin releasing a cells from the olfactory placard to the hypothalamus usually gnrh producing neurons the gnrh please keep in mind the gnrh producing neurons they have to migrate from the olfactory placard to the hypothalamus and from the hypothalamus they have to produce the gonadotropin hormones first of all gnrh will be released that will be coming to the anterior pituitary and from the anterior pituitary gonadotropin hormones like fsh lh will be released okay this is normal but if there is a failure in the migration of gonadotropin producing neurons from the olfactory placard to the hypothalamus that condition is called as kalman syndrome so here if they want to ask a question on kalman syndrome in that question clinical question they will definitely mention about a features of hypogonadism okay why because the, there is no migration so that the gonadotropin releasing hormones and the gonadotropic hormones fsh lh their levels are very very less because of that she will be present to the clinic with the features of amenorrhea along with that they will mention that this female is having features of anosmia okay no smell sensation so definitely they are asking about kalman syndrome now amenorrhea in the background of anosmia they are talking about kalman syndrome okay failure in the migration of gonadotropin producing neurons from the olfactory placard to the hypothalamus now one more important mcq this kalman syndrome is an example of see here there is no migration to the hypothalamus so from the hypothalamus the gonadotropic releasing hormone is not getting released and from the pituitary gland the gonadotropin hormones fsh lh they are not going to be released so it is hypogonadotropic leading to hypogonadism so this kalman syndrome is an example of hypogonadotropic hypogonadism okay 
Example of hypogonadotropic. Why? Because there is no migration, so that there is no gonadotropin hormones. FSHLH is not there. Hypogonadotropic. Hypogonadism. So because there is no gonadotropic hormones, these gonads are not properly functioning. Okay. So this is also very important MCQ. Now, after this, amenorrhea in the background of galactoria and headache. Guys, see here, in this condition, the, the female is having amenorrhea. Along with that, this female is having galactoria. What does it mean by galactoria, guys? Galactoria means milk production without or unrelated to a childbirth. Now, this female is having the milk production. She is having the milk production from the best. But she is not having a childbirth. This is galactoria. Now, what is this condition? Clinical condition is. This condition is an example of prolactinemia. Okay. Or we have to, like, you know, more specific. It is hyperprolactinemia. Okay. Hyper. Prolactinemia. Okay, so she is having hyperprolactinemia. We know that after the childbirth, there is release of prolactin. Now, this prolactin will give the negative feedback for the release of gonadotropin hormones. Now, in this female, whatever might be the reason, she is having a too much amount of prolactin, hyperprolactinemia. This too much amount of prolactin will give a negative feedback to the hypothalamus and pituitary to stop gonadotropin hormones so that she is not going to have FSH-LH. There is no FSH-LH that's going to cause amenorrhea in these females. So she is having amenorrhea. Okay, well and good. Now, because she is having too much amount of this prolactin, what's the function of prolactin? Galactopoiesis, milk production. So, she is having galactoria. Okay. So, this is an example of hyperprolactinemia. Okay. We will see what are the causes of most common cause of hyperprolactinemia. We will see. Don't worry. Now, let's talk about the Asherman syndrome. Guys, what exactly is Asherman syndrome? Asherman syndrome is intrauterine. adhesions or intrauterine synechae. Okay. Usually inside the uterine cavity, there shouldn't be any abnormal adhesions. Fibrous adhesions shouldn't be there. But if you have too much amount of abnormal fibrous adhesions, intrauterine adhesions, this condition is known as Asherman syndrome. Now, what are the causes of this Asherman syndrome. Why do a female will have? Why do a female have these abnormal adhesions inside her uterine cavity? Now, Asherman syndrome is because of vigorous curatage. Okay, so vigorous curatage. If she is having this vigorous curatage inside her uterus then this curatage can cause abnormal adhesions or even genital tuberculosis. Okay. Or infections like pelvic inflammatory disease. Okay, so these conditions, rigorous curatage, genital tuberculosis or pelvic inflammatory disease, any of these things can cause abnormal intrauterine. Okay, this is the uterine cavity. If she is having abnormal adhesions, those adhesions are known as Asherman syndrome. Now, what is the investigation of choice? So, what is the investigation? How can we know that the, this presence of uh, intrauterine adhesions? Investigation of choice here in this condition is hysteroscopy. Ok, 
okay we are going to send a small camera into the uterus and we are seeing how the uterine cavity is hysteroscopy okay we can also do hysterosalpingography but mostly the preferred technique is hysteroscopy now what is the treatment treatment is adhesio lysis okay hysteroscopic okay hysteroscopic adhesio lysis is the treatment done for asherman syndrome guys one more time i am saying what is the causes of asherman syndrome most commonly this asherman syndrome is because of vigorous acute attach okay now sequence of puberty in girls guys this is a very very important question repeatedly asked mcq now and this is also most of the students will get confused here sequence of puberty in the girl the first sign okay in the puberty is accelerated growth okay it starts with the accelerated growth followed by tilak okay what is meant by tilak tilak is breast budding okay tilak is the breast budding after breast budding we have pubark pubark means pubic hair development after pubark will be having growth spurt after that there will be menarche so what does it mean by menarche menarche means menses okay now please remember that overall the most common okay the overall the most common and the first sign is accelerated growth so this is the first thing to appear but it is unnoticed okay it is unnoticed by the family or even by the girl the most noticeable and the first noticeable change are if they ask a most specific pubertal change overall first common is accelerated growth okay if they ask you overall but most specific and noticeable pubertal change is tilak okay most specific is a tilak breast budding okay but overall most common or not most common overall first sign is accelerated growth okay guys now after this let's do the staging so staging this is the sequence sequences we have already seen accelerated growth followed by tilak pubark growth spurt and menarch but the staging the staging of a puberty in a female is done by so they will ask you direct single mcq single liner mcq what is the staging done what is the name of that staging okay this is enough if you know the name of the staging that will be enough it is tan staging okay so tan staging is the name of the staging done for the puberty after this pubic and axillary hair growth depends on guys the secondary sexual characters for example if i am talking about a breast development the breast development in a female is dependent on estrogens remember estrogens will cause the breast development but the axillary hair or the pubic hair their development depends on androgens the adrenal androgens okay now pubic and axillary hair growth depends on andro genes a very important mcq okay good now let's do the staging of hirsutism what is meant by hirsutism hirsutism is nothing but abnormal hair growth abnormal hair growth on the facial skin okay abnormal facial hair simply speaking now what is the staging the staging for the puberty is tanner staging but these days they are asking stages of hirsutism is fairy man fairy man galway 
staging okay ferryman galway staging is done for hirsutism okay guys now delayed puberty what does it mean by delayed puberty the name itself is that that puberty is delayed but according to the definition when we will say that the puberty is getting delayed delayed puberty is absence of breast development plus menstruation okay so menstruation is absent and breast development is also absent both are absent absence of breast development and menstruation by 13 years so if by 13 years if she is not having her breast development and menstruation that is delayed puberty or we, okay this is also you have to know absence of menstruation absence of menstruation irrespective of irrespective of breast development by 15 years okay so by 15 years irrespective of breast development means she have 15 years and she is not having her menses it doesn't matter whether she is having breast development or not means listen like this a female is a she is having the breast development and she is 15 years old and she is not having her menst menses started so you can consider it as delayed puberty okay or there is no breast development by a 13 years along with no menses this is also a definition for delayed puberty okay now what is the most common cause of this delayed puberty what is the most common cause what is the most common cause guys there are many causes but in the exam point of view this is at least you should have to know the most common cause of this delayed puberty is constitutional okay constitutional delay most common cause of delayed puberty is constitutional delay okay a repeatedly ask mcq after this precocious puberty delayed puberty is puberty getting late precocious puberty means early puberty okay so in the definition point of view in the definition what is the definition okay let's talk about the definition so when you will consider that a female is having a precocious puberty that is development of development of tilark okay development of a tilark what is meant by tilark it is a breast development so development of tilark by 8 years okay or before 8 years or development of menarch that is she have started her menses by 10 years okay so these two anything is an example of can be a definition for a precocious puberty early puberty okay so now if she is having this precocious puberty how you are going to treat this condition so drug of choice for precocious puberty is gnrh analogs okay so gnrh analogs like luprolide are the drugs ending with relin we can give them okay they are long acting gnrh analogs are the drug of choice for precocious puberty repeatedly ask mcq now let's discuss about hyperprolactinemia 
what is hyperprolactinemia high levels of prolactin in the blood now we have already seen if a female is having hyperprolactinemia such female is going to present to the clinic with high levels of prolactin gives the negative feedback to the pituitary and hypothalamus to inhibit gonadotropin releasing hormone and gonadotropin hormones that is fsh lh if she is having high levels of prolactin then there is no fsh lh if there is no fsh lh she cannot have her menses so she is going to present to the clinic with amenorrhea plus in the background of high levels of prolactin will make her lactate that is galactoria okay we have already seen now hyperprolactinemia what is the most common cause the most common cause of this hyperprolactinemia is prolacti nomas okay prolactinomas means the tumor of this prolactin producing cells in the anterior pituitary prolactinomas are the most common cause of hyperprolactinemia and they will ask you these prolactinomas most of the time are they microadenomas or macroadenomas most of the time they are micro adenomas okay these prolactinomas are microadenomas now investigation of choice if you want to find out that there is a prolactinoma in the anterior pituitary then investigation of choice is doing mri to brain mri brain is the investigation of choice now after investigation what is the treatment now if a female is having hyperprolactinemia means too much amount of prolactin then we have to give drugs which are acting against prolactin guys physiologically speaking what is the hormone which antagonizes the prolactin or which inhibit the production of prolactin in a normal female that is dopamine so we will give a dopamine agonists that is cabergoline so the treatment drug of choice is caber goline cabergoline is the drug of choice that is the dopamine agonist okay clinical features now i am talking about a prolactinomas if a female is having a prolactinoma such tumors will anteriorly compress the optic chiasma okay so anterior to pituitary gland we have optic chiasma now if these tumors they are they, it is growing that will compress the optic chiasma and cause the visual defects so clinically okay the clinical features we can write that this female who is having this prolactinomas will have a visual abnormalities like bitemporal hemi anopia okay bitemporal hemi anopia is the clinical feature seen with hyper prolactinomas okay now after this let's discuss about testicular feminization syndrome what is the other name for testicular feminization syndrome guys it's also known as androgen insensitivity a syndrome means this is a male a male who is making androgens but these androgens are resistant okay his tissues are resistant to the androgens it just seems like he is having androgens but there are no androgens why because those androgens are not working on the tissue so it is useless now in such conditions if there is no androgen like situation that external genitalia development will be a female like okay so a patient with testicular feminization syndrome is a boy who is raised as a girl okay and will have a normal breast development why because these androgens they are getting peripherally aromatized to estrogens in this body in his body so he will have a breast development okay i'm wording i'm using the word he will have the breast development why because the testosterone which are produced in his body will get peripherally aromatized to estrogens 
Now, what I want you guys to remember, if they gave a clinical question, okay, if they gave a clinical question, how they are going to give? A female present to the clinic with the complaint of a primary amenorrhea. On doing physical examination, she is having breast development. That do they will use tanner size 4 breast. Why? Because, okay, for that age, this is a very big breast. Why? Because too much amount of androgens, they are getting peripherally converted to lot of estrogens and lot of estrogens will make breast development. Even bigger breast will be seen. Tanner size 4 breast will be seen. But, underline this, no axillary hair, no pubic hair. Why no? Why? Because axillary hair and pubic hair need androgens for their development. Here, androgens are there, but they are non-functional. So, a very scanty or completely no, okay, axillary hair and pubic hair will be seen. Now, here, that's what, that's the one single point I want to keep in your mind. Testicular feminization syndrome, also known as androgen insensitivity syndrome, where there is amenorrhea. Okay, primary amenorrhea. She is going to present, not she, he is going to present with primary amenorrhea plus tanner size. Tanner size. Four breasts. Okay. Plus absence of R scanty. Pubic and axillary hair. Okay, guys. Now, after androgen insensitivity syndrome. Let's talk about Mullerian agenesis. In the name itself is there that Mullerian ducts, it is agenesis, not formed. So, how the patient is going to present to our clinic? Again, if you are not having Mullerian ducts, what are the derivatives of Mullerian ducts? From the Mullerian ducts, we have, okay, we will be again discussing, but as of now, Mullerian ducts will form a uterus cervix, a fallopian tubes and upper two-third of vagina. Okay, all these structures are derived from the Mullerian ducts. If the Mullerian ducts are not formed, then there is no uterus. If there is no uterus, definitely she cannot menstruate. So, a 13 to 14 year old female going to present to our clinic with a complaint of a primary MA Noria. Okay, so primary amenorrhea is there. Okay, upon doing, upon doing physical examination, what about the breast development? What do you think? Is it normal or not? Normal. Okay, breast development is there. Okay, breast development is there. Why there is breast development, guys? You have to know. Why? Why? Because here in this condition, only Mullerian ducts not formed. But what about the ovaries? Ovaries take their origin from genital ridge. So, genital ridge, there is no problem. Ovaries are there. If ovaries are there, they are making the estrogens and estrogens will cause the breast development. So, breast development is normal, but she is presented with the features of amenorrhea because there is no uterus. Upon doing ultrasonography, upon doing ultrasonography, there is no uterus, no cervix, no fallopian tubes, okay, and no upper one third of vagina is also absent. Why? Because Valerian agencies, okay. But uh, sometimes in the question, this is a keyword, sometimes there is a small part of a fallopian tube can be present. Okay. In Mullerian agencies, a small part of, okay, these fallopian tubes can be a present. Okay, guys. And what about the bar body? What about the bar body in this condition? Is it present or not? This is a perfect female. Only problem is 
mullerian ducts they haven't formed so bar body is present there is no problem with the bar body okay now let's continue with the mullerian duct abnormalities now let's continue with the embryology and mullerian disorders students here the first mcq very very important mcq and repeated mcq in our fmg exams is mullerian derivatives we know that mullerian duct in females are going to form the internal reproductive organs so what are the derivatives of mullerian duct guys the mullerian derivatives are uterus fallopian tubes cervix and upper two third of vagina okay so these are the derivatives of mullerian duct so upper two third of vagina is formed from the mullerian duct lower one third of vagina is derived from the urogenital sinus uro genital sinus okay a very important mcq now we know that vagina is a hollow tube which are lined by the vaginal epithelial cells now here they will ask you the vaginal epithelial cells first of all we have you have to know this basic thing vaginal epithelium is stratified squamous non keratinized epithelium okay that we know we will discuss again one more time but this vaginal epithelium is derived from so the vaginal epithelium please keep on keep this point vaginal epithelium is derived from endoderm of okay they will ask you whether it is endoderm ectoderm or mesoderm it is derived from endoderm of uro genital sinus okay so this is a very important point about vaginal epithelium they can ask you the same mcq but in a different format see listen the embryological development of vaginal epithelium is going to be derived from endoderm of urogenital sinus but if they ask you what is the hormone maintaining the vaginal epithelium maintenance of vaginal epithelium is by so the maintenance of vaginal epithelium is by estrogens okay maintenance of vaginal flora is by estrogens maintenance of vaginal acidic ph is by estrogens why because estrogens will maintain the vaginal flora the deuterolinis bacteria in the vagina and the deuterolinis bacteria will produce the lactic acid and maintains the vaginal ph acidic okay so maintenance is by estrogens remember okay now let's talk about the ovaries ovaries are derived from guys remember mullerian ducts are giving rise to uterus fallopian tubes cervix and upper two third of vagina lower two third of the lower one third of the vagina is derived from urogenital sinus but what about the gonads the gonads are ovaries in a female so these are derived from genital they are derived from genital ridge okay so this is a very important point that is the reason why in a female with mullerian agenesis okay mrkh syndrome mullerian agenesis here a mullerian agenesis female she will be having a normal breast development why why because she is not having her mullerian ducts so that she is not going to have her uterus cervix and upper two third of vagina but she is having her gonads why because the gonads ovaries are derived from the genital ridge so she is having her normal gonads and these normal ovaries producing the estrogens and these estrogens are causing the breast development so very important point ovaries are not derived from the mullerian duct ovaries are getting derived from genital ridge okay now mullerian duct remnants in male mullerian ducts should express and form the internal female reproductive organs but 
the mullerian ducts in a male fetus a male fetus will have both mullerian ducts as well as wolfian ducts same like female like no same in the case of female okay even a female fetus will have both mullerian ducts as well as wolfian ducts but in a male only wolfian duct should express mullerian duct should undergo regression so that's what i am talking about mullerian ducts they are regressed in males and they are left left as a remnants what are the remnants called as mullerian ducts remnants in male are appendix of testis and prostatic utricle okay appendix of testis also known as see this appendix of testis is also known as hydatid of hydatid of morgani okay a very important mcq remnants of mullerian ducts in male are appendix of testis and prostatic utricle now mullerian duct development in males is inhibited by see in the male the mullerian ducts they are getting inhibited like you know mullerian derivation okay the mullerian ducts they are not going to be developed so they are getting inhibited in a male so who inhibits this so it is anti mullerian hormone so the anti mullerian hormone in a male will inhibit the expression of mullerian ducts so the mullerian ducts will be inhibited and left as a remnants which are hydatid of morgani and prostatic utricle now so this anti mullerian hormone from where it is coming this anti mullerian hormone is coming from the testis and in the testis which cells produce this anti mullerian hormone it's the sertoli cells so sertoli cells produce anti mullerian hormone or anti mullerian factor okay now let's talk about the leydig cells guys testis it have two different types of cells mainly one is sertoli cells and other is leydig cells now sertoli cells we know that sertoli cells they they produce anti mullerian hormone leydig cells they produce testosterone okay this is the recent mcq in 2019 december okay recent mcq the interstitial cells of leydig produce testosterone or testosterone is produced by which cells interstitial cells of leydig which are present in the testis now so you guys mullerian duct it should express only in females wolfian duct it should express only in males but in males mullerian duct is getting inhibited in females wolfian duct is getting inhibited now the remnants of this wolfian duct in female are okay so the wolfian duct remnants in female are epophoron epophoron parophoron and gartner's duct okay epophoron parophoron and gartner's duct these are the wolfian duct remnants in a, a female which are present in the broad ligament okay that we'll discuss later now gene responsible for the development of internal and external reproductive organs in a male so guys see guys we know that both the male sex and female sex for example i'm talking about an embryo see this embryo it is a it can have bipotentiality or the gonads in the embryo they are bipotential in nature means the gonads the primitive gonads either they can turn into ovaries or they can turn into testis if they turn into ovaries the female is going to be like no the baby is going to be become female if they turn into testis the baby is going to develop into male so what i am trying to say a fetus it have bipotential nature which means the gonads in this a fetus they can either change into ovaries or they can either change into testis who determines this 
who determines it's the y chromosome if the fetus is having okay it, 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 i should call it as embryo if the embryo is having y chromosome now on the y chromosome there is a gene known as sry gene testis determinating factor sry gene or testis determinating factor now this sry gene will turn this primitive gonads into testis so the baby is going to be male so that's what i'm talking about so what is the gene that is responsible for the development of internal and external male genitalia what is that the gene is sry gene okay testis determinating factor sry gene or testis determinating factor now this sry gene it is present on which chromosome y chromosome this is also repeatedly asked mcq now on the y chromosome which arm short arm or long arm short arm okay short arm okay so the short arm is known as p so on the p arm of the y chromosome there is sry gene which is a testis determinating factor which will convert the primitive gonads into testis so that the baby is going to be male now target gene so this sry gene it have to activate other genes and other proteins so what is the target gene for sry gene it is the sox9 sox9 gene is the target gene for sry gene now what is the most common cause of ambiguous genitalia okay now let's talk about ambiguous genitalia what is meant by ambiguous genitalia which means confusion okay ambiguity is there okay now most common cause of this ambiguous genitalia in a male is okay so a male fetus like you know the baby is male but if you look at the external genitalia you are not so clear whether it is a penis with a scrotum or whether it is labia majora which are slightly fused so this is there is an ambiguity so most common cause of ambiguous genitalia in male is which syndrome it is testicular feminization syndrome tfs testicular feminization syndrome is also known as which syndrome androgen insensitivity syndrome guys we have already discussed androgen insensitivity syndrome or like no androgen insensitivity syndrome as yes, previously but this is not the time to discuss in detail we are doing rapid revision so in a male the most common cause of this ambiguity is testicular feminization syndrome where the patient where the baby is resistant to his testosterone testosterone will be there but this that testosterone cannot act okay now in females the most common cause of this ambiguity is congenital adrenal hyperplasia the name itself is there there is adrenal gland hyperplasia whenever there is adrenal gland hyperplasia we know that from the adrenal cortex there are three main important hormones producing what are they mineralocorticoid example is aldosterone glucocorticoid example is cortisol and the sex corticoid okay dihydroepiandrosterone is going to be produced from the adrenal gland so whenever there is adrenal hyperplasia especially more androgens are going to be produced and this androgens in a female fetus will cause ambiguity or will cause male like external genitalia okay so most common cause of ambiguous genitalia in a female is congenital adrenal hyperplasia okay now let's discuss some important mcqs about congenital adrenal hyperplasia cah congenital adrenal hyperplasia what is the most common enzyme deficient why congenital adrenal hyperplasia why due to deficiency of 21 hydroxylase deficiency of 21 hydroxylase is the most common enzyme deficient in ch now how to treat this condition how to treat what is the drug of choice for treatment not prevention okay just of course one same they are same steroids but for treatment of this condition you have to give this patient steroids okay steroids now please concentrate drug of choice for female at a risk of having child with congenital adrenal hyperplasia what does i mean by see there is a female she is having pregnancy first pregnancy and she gave birth to a child 
who is having congenital adrenal hyperplasia okay well and good now for the next time she is again pregnant now this female she is at risk that even this second child can have congenital adrenal hyperplasia so she is at risk of giving birth to a child who can have congenital adrenal hyperplasia now how to prevent congenital adrenal hyperplasia in the next child means you have to give dexa methasone dexa methasone to whom to mother so dexa methasone should be given to the mother okay when at the time of diagnosis of pregnancy okay immediately at the time of diagnosis of pregnancy if you know that she get pregnant immediately give her dexamethasone okay this can prevent congenital adrenal hyperplasia in the upcoming child now let's talk about 17 hydroxy progesterone levels guys remember you have to know a something a basic concept okay something basic concept see usually in adrenal gland okay let me write it for you here see usually in the adrenal gland adrenal gland that why i am talking in adrenal cortex in the adrenal cortex cholesterol will be converted into upon action see under the action of acth under the action of adenocorticotropic hormone from the pituitary gland cholesterol will be converted into pregnenolone preg nina lone okay now this pregnant lone will be converted into 17 hydroxy progesterone okay that will be converted to 17 hydroxy progesterone now this 17 hydroxy progesterone it can have three fates what are they either the 17 hydroxy progesterone it can convert it into mineralocorticoid that is aldosterone or it can get converted into corti sol or it can get converted into sex steroids okay you know mainly male sex steroids androgens now please concentrate this 17 hydroxy progesterone if you expect that to convert it into aldosterone and cortisol that needs a common enzyme the common enzyme which is necessary for both aldosterone pathway and cortisol pathway is 21 hydroxylase 21 hydroxylase is must and should for the production of aldosterone and cortisol in a normal being now this cortisol see after getting see after getting produced this cortisol it will go and give negative feedback to pituitary gland and pituitary gland stops to release acth now here in congenital adrenal hyperplasia what actually happening there is a deficiency of 21 hydroxylase okay 21 hydroxylase it is deficient so there is no aldosterone no cortisol whenever there is no cortisol there is no negative a feedback whenever there is no negative feedback what happens pituitary is releasing acth in high amounts if pituitary is releasing acth in high amounts cholesterol is getting converted into pregnenolone and pregnenolone is getting converted into 17 hydroxy progesterone so in a patient with congenital adrenal hyperplasia what is the level of 17 hydroxy progesterone there will be higher levels of 17 hydroxy progesterone in a patient with congenital adrenal hyperplasia okay that's a very important mcq you should keep in mind okay that's also the first investigation to be done if you like you know they they used to say like something like this you know the first investigation to be done in the case of congenital adrenal hyperplasia is checking 17 hydroxy progesterone levels now let's write here 17 hydroxy progesterone levels in a cih patient is elevated okay vertical fusion defects can cause what does it mean by vertical fusion defect guys vertical fusion defect means we know that the upper two third of vagina 
is derived from the Miller index. Lower one third of vagina, it is derived from urogenital sinus. So they have to fuse. So whenever they are not fusing properly, it will cause a transverse septum in the vagina. That is, vertical fusion defect will cause transverse vaginal septum. Okay, so we have already discussed this and the most common site of this transverse vaginal septum is the upper one third of the vagina and near the external os. We have already seen this. Most common uterine anomalies. The most common uterine anomaly is septate uterus. Okay. Followed by bicornuate uterus. Okay, septate uterus is the most common uterine anomaly. Now, let's talk some important points about septate uterus. Now, we have already seen most common uterine anomaly is septate uterus. Okay, that's the first important point. This is the most common uterine anomaly. Okay, most common uterine anomaly. What are the other important points of septate uterus? Septate uterus is most commonly associated with abortions okay the uterine anomaly which causes maximum abortions associated with the abortions it is septate uterus okay most commonly associated with abortions and most commonly associated with infertility Okay, let's talk about unicornuate uterus. Unicornuate uterus is most commonly associated with renal agenesis. Unicornuate uterus have Worst reproductive outcome. Okay, guys. Now, most common problem associated with uterine anomalies. So, if a female is having this uterine anomalies like biconvate uterus, unicornuate uterus, or septate uterus, arcuate uterus, or uterus didal phase, these kind of uterine anomalies. If she have any of these anomalies, then she can have abortions. Okay, well and good. Are these abortions are going to happen in first trimester, second trimester or third trimester? Remember, it is that second trimester abortions. Uterine anomalies are associated with second trimester abortions. These So, investigation of choice in Mullerian abnormalities or uterine abnormalities. Investigation of choice for uterine anomalies is MRI. Okay, so the best will be MRI. But gold standard investigation is hysteroscopy. Okay, now best time to do the vaginoplasty if you see a female with Mullerian agenesis. Now, in a female with Mullerian agenesis, she is having only lower one third of vagina. She is just having like a blind pouch. Now, she is not having her complete vagina. So, she cannot participate in intercourse. So, for such female, we can do vaginoplasty. Now, what is the best time or ideal time to do the vaginoplasty? It was previous AIMS question. So, the best time to do vaginoplasty in a female with vaginal agenesis, either in the case of Mullerian agenesis or some other disorder, it is before marriage. So, before marriage or just at the time of marriage, is the best time or ideal time to do the vaginoplasty. Now, let's continue with the important points in menstrual cycle. 
let's continue with the important points in menstrual cycle ovarian cycle begins with the hormone guys we know in menstrual cycle we have two parts ovarian events that is ovarian cycle and the uterine cycle now what is the hormone which is responsible for the initiation of the ovarian cycle or the ovarian cycle is started by which hormone so in the ovaries what's actually happening the follicles are getting matured now this matured follicles will produce the estrogens and those estrogens will go to the uterus and causes the proliferatory changes we know so in the ovaries follicles are growing who stimulates the follicles for the production of estrogens it is follicle stimulating hormone so ovarian cycle begins with the follicle stimulating hormone okay f s h follicle stimulating hormone is the hormone responsible for the ovarian cycle initiation now granulosa cells produce we know around the oocyte we have the granulosa cells now these granulosa cells will produce which hormone now granulosa cells produce estrogens estrogens but ovaries in ovaries not only estrogens are made but also androgens are also produced so who produce androgens in the ovaries so the androgens in a ovary are produced by theca interna cells okay so theca interna cells produce the androgens and these androgens will go into the granulosa cells now inside the granulosa cells these androgens are converted to estrogens so what is the enzyme responsible for the conversion of androgens into estrogens that is aromatase okay see here enzyme required for conversion of androgens which are produced in theca interna cells they are getting converted into estrogens in granulosa cells so what is the enzyme required it is aroma taste okay a very important mcq okay please keep this point in mind now primary oocytes are arrested in we know that these primary oocytes they are arrested in which state they are arrested in meiosis 1 prophase 1 okay pro phase 1 of meiosis 1 in prophase 1 of meiosis 1 these primary oocytes are arrested now these primary oocytes they will resume the meiosis 1 during when now we know that this meiosis 1 will be completed at the time of ovulation so that the primary oocyte will be converted into secondary oocyte we know it but what is the hormone responsible for the resumption of this meiosis 1 and what's happening the meiosis 1 will be resumed so that meiosis 1 will be completed so what is that hormone responsible it is the lh okay so hormone responsible for resuming the meiosis 1 is luteinizing hormone now so lh surge is initiated by we know that luteinizing hormone resumes the meiosis 1 so that meiosis 1 will be completed by the time of ovulation now who actually initiate this lh surge who is the kick starter of this lh surge it is estrogens especially estradiol okay okay estradiol e2 now estradiol levels okay more than 200 picogram per ml for 48 hours 
will trigger the LH search. Guys, exactly you have to keep this point in mind. Who initiate LH search? LH surge is initiated by estradiol levels. These estradiol levels of more than 200 picograms for 48 hours will give the feedback for the LH search. Okay, now proliferatory changes in the uterine endometrium is caused by. Guys, in uterine cycle, we have a two phases. First phase is proliferatory phase and second phase is the secretory phase. During proliferatory phase, what happens? The uterine endometrium proliferates. During secretory phase, uterine endometrium will become more vascular and more secretory. Now, proliferatory changes in uterine endometrium is caused by estrogens. Estrogens from the growing follicle will come to the uterus and causes the proliferatory changes. Now, the secretory changes in the uterine endometrium is because of, everyone knows that it is because of uh, progesterone. Okay. Now, please remember, estrogens they are getting, see, these estrogens from where they are coming? Estrogens are coming from the growing follicles in the ovary. Now, from where do these progesterones are coming? These progesterones, they are coming from the Carpus luteum. Okay. Carpus luteum is producing the progesterones and these progesterones are coming to the uterine endometrium and bringing the secretory changes in the uterine endometrium. Now, ovulation occurs. We know that ovulation occurs on the 14th day of the cycle usually. But in what aspect I am talking? I am talking in the point of LH search. See, ovulation occurs 32 to 36 hours after LH surge. Okay. So, after the initiation of LH surge, it takes 32 to 36 hours for the ovulation to happen or 10 to 12 hours after LH peak. Okay. After the attainments of high levels of LH, that is LH peak. After LH peak, it takes almost 10 to 12 hours for the ovulation to happen. Okay. Now, first polar body is released during. Guys, these are very important MCQs. First polar body is released during and second polar body is released during. So, first polar body is released during ovulation. Now, second polar body is released during fertilization. So, after fertilization, after the sperm enters into the ovum, then the second polar body is released. Let's go. So, graphene follicle size before ovulation. Guys, just before ovulation, the graphene follicle is almost 18 to 20 mm in size. Okay, just before ovulation, the graphene follicle size is almost 18 to 20 mm. Now, ruptured graphene follicle is known as. So, during ovulation, what happens guys? The graphene follicle, it will rupture and release secondary oocyte as well as first polar body. So, this ruptured graphene follicle will become Carpus luteum. Okay. Ruptured graphene follicle is known as. Okay. Now, pain on the day of ovulation is known as. Certain females will experience pain on the day of ovulation. Most of the females will have pain during menstruation. That is dysmenorrhea. But some females can experience pain even during the day of ovulation. Okay. They will say, you know, uh, I might have ovulated. They might experience this pain. So, this pain is known as mid-cycle pain. Okay, mid-cycle. Now, the mid-cycle ovulation is happening. So, pain on the day of ovulation is known as mid-cycle pain. Also known as Mittelschmerz pain. Okay. So, Mittelschmerz pain is a pain during ovulation. Okay. It's the spelling is little bit wrong. But, okay, excuse me. Mittelschmerz pain. Now, Corpus luteum produce. Guys, you know, the ruptured graphene follicle become 
corpus luteum and this corpus luteum produce which hormones everyone know that ruptured graafian follicle becomes corpus luteum and this corpus luteum is producing the progesterone everyone knows but not only progesterone this corpus luteum produce inhibin a comma estrogens and progesterone okay but if someone ask you corpus luteum mainly produce corpus luteum mainly produce progesterone but if someone ask you corpus luteum produce inhibin a estrogen as well as progesterone now corpus luteum is maintained by guys in a non pregnant state okay non pregnant state means there is no pregnancy in a normal female she is not married she is a normal female in her menstruation is happening and there is formation of corpus luteum in such a female this corpus luteum is maintained by luteinizing hormone so luteinizing hormone maintains the corpus luteum and it produces the progesterone but in a pregnant female okay in a pregnant female the corpus luteum is maintained by it is beta hcg okay so beta hcg maintains the corpus luteum now what is the life span of this corpus luteum in a non pregnant state it will be there for 10 10 to 12 days okay so 10 to 12 days is the life span of the corpus luteum in pregnant state the same corpus luteum because of beta hcg it will be there for 10 to 12 weeks okay now maximum corpus luteum activity see guys corpus luteum it's mainly producing the progesterones and these progesterone brings the secretory changes in the uterine endometrium now maximum corpus luteum activity means ma that's the day where there is maximum progesterone secretion so if they ask you either maximum corpus luteum activity or maximum progesterone is seen on they are one and the same it is seen on eighth day after ovulation okay eight days after ovulation or i can say it as 22nd day of menstrual cycle okay so on 14th day ovulation is happening 14 plus 8 that is 22 so on 22nd day of menstrual cycle there is a maximum production of a progesterone or maximum corpus luteal activity guys the same question can be asked in a different way see we know this progesterones they will give negative feedback to fsh and lh so the minimum amount of so the minimum levels of fsh and lh are seen on same 22nd day of menstrual cycle okay please that also keep in mind now pain during menstruation guys during a normal menstrual cycle okay normal healthy menstrual cycle a female will experience pain okay that is absolutely normal this is dysmenorrhea now what is the one responsible for this pain production or pain causation so pain during menstruation is due to prostaglandins okay especially prostaglandin f2 okay prostaglandin f2 is produced that prostaglandins will cause the uterine contractions okay that causes the pain during menstrual cycle now regeneration of endometrium during next cycle is by we know that female will have these menstrual cycles okay every month so every month she is going to shed her menstrual like you know endometrium 
and that endometrium will be expelled out and in the next cycle again there is regeneration of the endometrium now this regeneration is because of which layer of endometrium it is stratum basalis okay so stratum basalis is not going to be shedded and it's not going to be expelled it's just like you know a germ cell layer it's going to be there always so it's going to regenerate and that regenerated endometrium that will be shedded and expelled out and in the next cycle again the same stratum basalis it will again cause the regeneration proliferation of the uterine endometrium now first sign of ovulation on endometrial biopsy so if you do endometrial biopsy and if you want to know whether there is ovulation happened or not in this female then the first sign on endometrial biopsy is basal vacuolization okay so basal vacuolization of endometrium okay so basal vacuolization is the first sign saying that ovulation happened now immediately after menstruation thickness of endometrium is so after menstruation the endometrial thickness is going to be a very thin so what's that okay very important mcq that is 0.5 mm thickness so 0.5 mm a thickness now vaginal changes during a menstrual cycle guys remember we are talking about the vaginal changes usually the vagina is lined by which epithelium guys it is stratified squamous non keratinized epithelium how many different kinds of epithelial cells present in the vagina three different types of epithelial cells what are they they are basal or para basal cells intermediary cells and superficial cells so the dominance of these cells depends on a different different phases of the menstrual cycle for example during a proliferatory stage of menstrual cycle okay proliferatory changes happening in the uterine endometrium so during proliferatory changes what is the major hormone that is estrogen estrogen during proliferative stage because of estrogen dominance or during estrogen dominance which cells will be more in the vagina it is superficial cells okay superficial cells are more predominant in number during estrogen dominance or during proliferatory stage now during secretory stage we know that the progesterone is the predominant hormone or the dominant hormone so the predominant number of cells in the vagina are intermediary cells okay so intermediate cells are more predominant during secretory stage or during progesterone predominance now increasing order of progesterone sorry increasing order of potency of estrogens guys how many different types of estrogens are there we have e1 e2 and e3 so out of this increasing order which is the least potent estrogen that is e3 so the e3 is least potent and this e3 is especially produced during a pregnancy most specific estrogen of pregnancy is e3 after e3 it is e1 okay estrone okay first one is estriol e3 next it is e1 estrone so estrone is usually produced due to peripheral aromatization okay androgens are getting converted into estrogens and these estrogens are estrone okay we have already seen in the theca internals this is happening because of the enzyme aromatase after e1 the most potent estrogen is e2 okay e2 now this e2 is especially seen in reproductive age women okay now this is the order very important now day of ovulation is so what is like how can we know 
when the female have ovulated what is the day of ovulation so it's very easy the formula is length of menstrual cycle minus 14 days okay so this is the formula for knowing what is the day of ovulation which means for example a female is having a 40 day menstrual cycle okay like you know uh, her menstrual cycle the length of her menstrual cycle is 40 days for example okay i am taking 40 days now minus 14 days see this minus 14 is constant so on which day she might have ovulated 40 minus 14 it is on day 26 she have ovulated so this is the day of ovulation okay guys now we have seen all the important mcqs from the topic of menstrual cycle now let's continue with the genital infections most common cause of vaginitis okay if they ask you most common cause of vaginitis overall see we have different types of vaginitis that is bacterial vaginosis candidiasis trichomonas vaginitis atrophic vaginitis so on so out of all this what is the most common vaginitis overall that is bacterial bacterial vaginosis okay now most common cause of vaginitis in young females see young females are sexually active so they can have vaginitis might be because of some organism which is spreading through sex so most common vaginitis in young females is that is trichomonas vaginitis okay important Amsel's criteria is used for the diagnosis of okay what Amsel's criteria we will discuss later okay so Amsel's criteria is used for the diagnosis of bacterial vaginosis Okay, for diagnosis at least you need to have three out of four criteria so what are those five criteria four criteria we will discuss later now bacteria attached with vaginal epithelial cells in bacterial vaginosis see usually these are the vaginal epithelial cells okay so to those vaginal epithelial cells there is bacteria attaching over the epithelial cells so these epithelial cells which are attached with bacteria okay those are known as clue cells so clue cells are seen in which condition so clue cells are seen in bacterial vaginosis okay a very very important point so it's one of the part of Amsel's criteria so presence of clue cells bacterial vaginosis so other criteria after amine whiff test let's discuss about bacterial vaginosis in bacterial vaginosis there is itching or not the answer is no bacterial vaginosis patient there is no inflammation in the region of vagina so there is no pruritis in bacterial vaginosis there is no itching okay a very very important mcq no itching in bacterial vaginosis no pruritis now scoring system used for diagnosis of bacterial vaginosis so what is this scoring system that is Nugent scoring usually a score greater than 7 is an indicative of bacterial vaginosis ok I am not going in detail what is Nugent scoring but simply remember Nugent scoring is used for diagnosing bacterial vaginosis ok now in bacterial vaginosis what is the usual ph of vagina the usual ph of vagina is more of alkaline okay so usually the ph of vagina is more than 4.5 okay it's like you know it's little bit moving towards alkalinity okay 
Now, this is the MCQ from 2019 December FMG. Organisms causing bacterial vaginosis. Okay, so organisms which are usually found in a woman with bacterial vaginosis are organisms causing bacterial vaginosis. The most common organism, see in the vagina, Dodalini bacteria are the inhabitant bacteria. But in the place of Dodalini's bacteria, if any bacteria replaces that place, that will cause bacterial vaginosis. So what are that abnormal bacteria? The most common organism that causing bacterial vaginosis is Gardnerella species. Okay. So this is the most common organism. Other than this, you also have to know. Okay. So bacterioid species, Mobilinca species, Prevotella, Clostridium, Porphyromonas and Mycoplasma hominis species. They can also cause bacterial vaginosis. Okay. Most common is Gardnerella. Now, most common vaginitis in OCP users means oral contraceptive pill users or in pregnancy, in diabetes patient or immunocompromised states like no HIV. Now, what is the vaginitis that is going to be mainly seen in this particular group of people? Okay, this particular group of people, what kind of vaginitis is most common? Is it bacterial vaginosis, trichomonas vaginitis, candidiasis or atrophic vaginitis? It is candidiasis. Okay. Candidiasis is most commonly associated with the immunocompromised patients. Very, very important point. Okay. Now, most common organism causing candidiasis. See, this candidiasis is because of a fungi. Now, most common organisms, see, there are many organisms causing candidiasis. What are they? Candida albicans, Candida galbata, Candida tropicalis. Many organisms are there. But out of all, Candida albicans. Candida albicans is the most common organism. Now, discharge in candidiasis. So, this is a very, very important point and it's a clue. Like, you know, uh, with this, we can establish, you know, uh, the diagnosis or with this, by seeing this point, we can say that the examiner is asking about candidiasis. The discharge in candidiasis looks like a curd, okay? So, curdy white discharge or cottage cheese like discharge. Cottage cheese like discharge. Okay, so cottage cheese like discharge is seen in candidiasis. Now, so what is the pH seen in candidiasis? Usually, this candidiasis will occur even in acidic pH. So, the pH of this patient is less than 4.5, that is more acidic. So, this candidiasis, they used to say like this the candidiasis is the vaginitis even occurring in acidic pH. Okay, very important point. Now, microscopic findings in candidiasis. See, candida is because of a fungi. Now, what are the fungal components you can see on a microscopy that are hyphae. Okay, so hyphae are pseudo hyphae. So, hyphae or pseudo hyphae are seen on microscopy. Strawberry vagina is seen in which condition? See, the strawberry vagina is also known as angry looking vagina. The strawberry vagina is seen in trichomonas vaginitis. Okay. Now, this trichomonas vaginitis is a sexually transmitted disease. Now, trichomonas vaginalis. So, this organism which is causing trichomonas vaginitis is trichomonas vaginalis. This trichomonas vaginalis is a flagellated protozoan.
ओके फ्लैजेलेटेड इज द मोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंट पॉइंट नाउ वेजेनल डिस्चार्ज इन ट्राइकोमोनास वेजेनालिसिस से हियर द वेजेनल डिस्चार्ज इज ग्रीनिश इन कलर ओके ग्रीनिश आर इवन समाइम एलोइश ओके ग्रीनिश आर एलोइश डिस्चार्ज विथ फिशी स्मेलिंग ओके इंटेंस फिशी स्मेलिंग अ ग्रीनिश आर एलोइश कलर डिस्चार्ज इज सीन विद द ट्राइकोमोनास वेजाइनाइटिस इन्फेक्शन okay now microscopic findings in trichomonas vaginitis see if you put this discharge and see it under the microscope you can see the flagellated organisms which are motile so under microscopy you can see motile flagellated organisms okay now so what is the ph in trichomonas vaginitis condition so usually here the ph is again moving towards alkalinity so usually ph is somewhere between 5 to 6 now treatment of atrophic vaginitis see in a post menopausal women there is a decrease in the estrogen levels because of decrease estrogen levels in a post menopausal women what happens the vaginal epithelium is undergoing atrophy that will cause atrophic vaginitis in such a female we will give a local estrogen ointments okay so local estrogen creams okay local estrogen creams are given in atrophic vaginitis or senile vaginitis now most common cause of pelvic inflammatory diseases so this is the 2019 december mcq fmg most common cause of pelvic inflammatory disease is chlamydia okay so chlamydia is the most common cause followed by gonorrhea okay now gonorrhea infections are usually associated with guys remember wherever there is gonorrhea most of the time there will be a chlamydia so gonorrhea and chlamydia infections they coexist together gonorrhea infections are associated with chlamydia okay now most common site of gonorrhea is so in a female what is the most common site the most common site of gonorrhea is endo cervix okay endocervix is the most common site followed by endocervix okay that is urethra okay urethra and bartholini glands so what are the most common site of gonorrhea infection main it is endocervix urethra and bartholin's glands now culture media for gonorrhea is like it's a little bit microbiology type if you want to culture gonorrhea the culture media used is thayer martins media okay but if they ask you what is the transport media for gonorrhea and even meningococci that is stuart emis media okay please keep the point in mind now drug of choice for gonorrhea is that is ceftriaxone okay very very important mcq keep on repeatedly ask mcq that's a third generation cephalosporin which is ceftriaxone so ceftriaxone is the drug of choice for gonorrhea infections and for drug of choice for chlamydial infections is ezithromycin okay now single heart painless canker so on the genitalia there is single solitary painless canker is seen in which infections it is 
yes if you are saying it as syphilis you are absolutely true that is primary syphilis so primary syphilis will have canker and secondary syphilis will have condyloma lata and in tertiary syphilis the patient will have neurosyphilis and even the iota of the patient will be affected iota will be affected giving tree bark appearance okay patho related points now cancroid is caused by a chancroid is caused by it is caused by hemophilus ducri okay so hemophilus ducri causes chancroid now dome shaped exact question 2019 june fmg dome shaped pearly white a central umbilicated lesions are seen in infection with okay the lesions are something like a dome shape with the central umbilication okay pearly white so these type of lesions are seen in infections of what is the disease which cause this kind of uh, lesions that is molluscum contagiosum okay so molluscum contagiosum you will see dome shaped pearly white lesions with central umbilications now genital warts anogenital warts or condyloma acuminata is because of which virus it is human papilloma virus okay 6 and 11 are associated with the anogenital warts now most common root of spread of pelvic inflammatory disease what is meant by pelvic inflammatory disease it is a inflammation of upper reproductive tract organs like uterus fallopian tubes ovaries now most common cause of pelvic inflammatory disease is chlamydia we have already seen but what is the most common root of spread of this pelvic inflammatory disease that is ascending infection along with the sperms means the infection is coming from down along with the sperms it's a ascending infection ascending infections along with sperms okay so from lower reproductive tract the infection is spreading up ascending infection now genital tb is spread by guys usually if someone ask you what is the mode of spread of pelvic inflammatory disease that is ascending infection along with the sperms genital tb will also cause pelvic inflammatory disease but the root of spread of this genital tb is different so that's what we are talking about genital tb which is causing pelvic inflammatory disease is spread by which root it is hemato genus root hematogenous root now investigation of choice in diagnosis of pelvic inflammatory disease so if you want to diagnose that the patient is having pelvic inflammatory disease so the investigation of choice is it is laparoscopy okay a very very important mcq now histosalpingography in tb guys usually if a patient if the patient is having genital tb then we won't do histosalpingography histosalpingography is contraindicated in genital tb but by mistake without knowing that the patient is having genital tb if someone performs this histosalpingography then what kind of appearances we will see now upon doing histosalpingography now we will see beaded appearance of okay beaded appearance of tubes okay along with that we can see tobacco pouch appearance
okay tobacco pouch appearance of tubes at fimbrial end tubes in the sense i am talking about the fallopian tubes along with that the patient can have Asherman syndrome upon doing hysterosalpingography we can see that in a patient with genital tuberculosis can have intrauterine adhesions that will give honeycomb appearance okay okay so this honeycomb appearance upon doing hysterosalpingography is due to Asherman syndrome seen as a part of pelvic inflammatory disease okay now after that we can also see lead pipe appearance okay lead pipe appearance of fallopian tubes lead pipe appearance in patho point of view where do we see lead pipe appearance is seen in ulcerative colitis on radiology okay now we have seen all the important points in the genital infections now later continue with the topic of contraception now let's continue with the topic of contraception effectiveness of contraceptive or the index of contraceptive failure is calculated by which means how good a contraceptive is or how bad a contraceptive is can be calculated by an index known as pearls index okay pearls index will say us how good or how bad the contraceptive is so if they ask you contraceptive failure rate is indicated by pearls index now pearls index formula is total accidental pregnancies into 1200 divided by number of patients observed into months of usage okay into months of usage of the contraceptive so this is the formula at least know this formula that would be enough total accidental pregnancies happened into 1200 by number of patients observed into number of months usage of a contraceptive this is the pearls index okay now pearls index of a male condom is okay a very important mcq very very important repeated mcq pearls index of a male condom is somewhere lies between a 2 to 18 okay 2 to 18 is the pearls index for the male condom now billings method of contraception is based on guys remember what exactly is billings method billings method is a cervical mucus study so based on the consistency of the cervical mucus we estimate whether the ovulation happened or not okay so billings method of contraception is based on cervical mucus okay so usually at the time of ovulation the cervical mucus will become more watery will become more profuse thin but during luteal phase because of the progesterones the cervical mucus become more thick in consistency okay so billings method is based on cervical mucus important now while using calendar method of contraception the unsafe days are so which days in a calendar month are considered to be unsafe unsafe in the sense you know if the female and male participate in intercourse there is a chance that they can become pregnant okay she can become pregnant so which days are considered as unsafe days 8 to 18 days okay 8 to 18 days in her menstrual cycle so these days 8 to 18 days are considered to be 
unsafe days okay important so there is a controversy over this area you know some books will mention uh, 12 to 18 days but the better answer would be 8 to 18 days are considered to be unsafe days now the change in the basal body temperature guys please remember whenever there is ovulation happened during the time of ovulation there is increase in the body temperature by 0 0.5 degree centigrade this increase in basal body temperature is an indicative of ovulation and this increase is because of which hormone the hormone responsible for this increase in basal body temperature is progesterone okay why because progesterone is a thermogenic hormone now vaginal diaphragm should be removed after how much time after is this not ovulation after intercourse okay it's just a typing mistake guys remember vaginal diaphragm should be removed after how much time after intercourse see we know that these vaginal diaphragms are acting as a barrier method of contraception so after intercourse after how much time this diaphragm should be removed these diaphragms should not be removed immediately after intercourse at least after six to eight hours these vaginal diaphragms are removed okay and these vaginal diaphragms should not be kept for more than 24 hours that also keep in mind now longest acting intrauterine contraceptive device is what is the longest acting there are a lot of contraceptive device the longest acting contraceptive device is copper t 380a copper t 380a is the longest acting intrauterine contraceptive device which is almost effective for a 10 years okay now in copper t 380 300 stands for okay in copper t 380 not 300 380 here should be 380 this 380 this numerical value this 380 should stand like you know, it stands for what this 380 stands for the total surface area of the copper okay so in the copper t so the total surface area of this copper in copper 380a is 380 mm square so in copper t 380 380 stands for total surface area of copper okay important and this a stands for see this a after 380 it stands for arm so this copper is wounded over the arms of the copper t 380 now only copper t approved for use in india is it is copper t 380A. Okay, important. Next, method of insertion of IUCD. So, what is the method by which intrauterine contraceptive devices are inserted? That method is known as no touch technique. No touch. No touch technique or withdrawal technique. Mirena is Mirena is a third generation IUCD. Mirena is third generation intrauterine contraceptive device. See, third generation contraceptive devices are hormonal IUCDs. Okay. So in Mirena there is progesterone. So, this Mirena contains, so Mirena contains what? 52 milligrams of levonorgestrel. Okay. So, Mirena contains, it's a hormonal IUD. It's a third generation hormonal IUD. So, it contains 52 milligrams of levonorgestrel. And every day, there is a 20 a microgram release. So, every day, it releases 20 microgram of levonorgestrel 
and that causes contraception non contraceptive benefits of mirena are see this mirena it's a third generation contraceptive device which is a hormonal iucd now apart from contraception this mirena can also help in okay can also help in treating meno regia it can help in treating the menorrhagia or dysmenorrhea okay dysmenorrhea can be treated endometrial hyperplasia adenomyosis endometriosis and leiomyomas okay so non contraceptive benefits of mirena are the following okay it can be used in the treatment of menorrhagia and dysmenorrhea and it also can be used to prevent endometrial hyperplasia and also can be used to treat the endometrial hyperplasia and it can be used in leiomyomas and adenomyosis and endometriosis treatment now today is so don't please just answer today date okay so today is a vaginal sponge okay so today is a vaginal sponge which is used as a barrier method okay so what is the spermicidal agent present in this today so the spermicidal agent which is present in this today is non oxinol okay non oxinol 9 is the spermicidal agent which kills the sperms so if someone ask you what is the mechanism of action of these spermicidal agents that is non oxinol 9 these spermicidal agents will cause the rupture of cell membrane of the sperms okay so this is the mechanism of action please keep that point in mind so mechanism of action of the spermicidal agent is rupture cell membranes of sperms and kills the sperm absolute contraindications of intrauterine devices okay intrauterine contraceptive devices so what are the absolute contraindications so what are the conditions in which you are never supposed to use intrauterine contraceptive device in a female it is puerperal sepsis one second condition is unexplained vaginal bleeding or dysfunctional uterine bleeding dub third condition is gestational trophoblastic neoplasia okay now fourth example is ongoing pelvic inflammatory disease okay so current pelvic inflammatory disease is an absolute contraindication for intrauterine contraceptive device placement next cancer of cervix and cancer of endometrium okay cancer cervix and cancer endometrium are also absolute contraindications for intrauterine contraceptive devices after that let's see what are the contra indications for oral contraceptive pills after seeing the contra indications for intrauterine contraceptive devices iucds let's see the absolute contra indications for oral contraceptive pills so let's write one by one yeah one it's breast cancer breast cancer ca breast is a absolute contraindication hyper cholesterolemia 
okay so hypercholesterolemia or hypertriglyceridemia is absolute contraindication for the usage of oral contraceptive pills next unexplained vaginal bleeding if a female is a smoker more than at 35 years is also absolute contraindication for ocp usage next thrombo embolic disorders okay so thrombo embolic events okay past history of thrombo embolic events is also absolute contraindication for usage of oral contraceptive pills pregnancy hypertension liver disease and diabetes mellitus so these nine conditions are absolute contraindications where a female is never supposed to take oral contraceptive pills if she if she fall into any of these conditions okay guys so a two very important topics which you should never miss is absolute contraindications for iucds and absolute contraindications for usage of oral contraceptive pills after seeing this let's see what is known as a gossip poll okay i will give you one minute to think please think what kind of a drug is a gossip poll okay what kind of a drug is a gossip poll okay now let's discuss gossip poll is extracted from cotton seeds okay especially this was discovered in china okay this gossip oil it's extracted from a cotton seeds which will cause which will act on seminiferous tubules seminiferous tubules and will cause inhibition of spermatogenesis so gossipol is a contraceptive agent which is used by a male so if gossipol is taken by a male what happens there is inhibition of spermatogenesis so if someone ask you what is a contraceptive drug taken by a male that is gossipol okay now after this a non steroidal oral contraceptive is non steroidal oral contraceptive that is centro centromen okay centromen is a non steroidal contraceptive okay this is also known as ormeloxifene okay but centromen is a non steroidal contraceptive drug after this most common method of contraceptive used by couples in india what do you think is it barrier method or is it oral contraceptive pills intrauterine contraceptive devices or sterilization it is barrier's method barrier's method so barrier's method is the most common contraceptive used by the couples in india now best contraceptive method for separated couples or couples living far from each other okay the wife is in india and the husband is somewhere outside india now they are separated couple so when they meet together if they want to use a contraceptive method which will be best for such kind of separated couples again it is barrier method okay now safest method of contraception is again same answer barrier method okay so very very important after this let's see only contraceptive 
to give protection against hiv or stds so which method will prevent sexually transmitted diseases barrier method the two in barrier method it's only condoms okay so condoms are the only contraceptives okay not all barrier methods will prevent the stds no false only condoms are the contraceptive contraceptives which will prevent the sexually transmitted diseases like hiv okay now best method for newly married couple is most of you guys will think that it is a barrier method but no it's the oral contraceptive pills are best for newly married couple so they will ask you something like this ideal contraceptive for newly married couple is oral contraceptive pills now most effective method of emergency contraception is now we are talking about emergency contraception now the most effective method is copper t intra uterine contraceptive device so the placement of copper t intra uterine contraceptive device is best in times of emergency contraception okay now so composition of mala d and mala n so the composition of mala d and mala n are see both mala d and mala n contains ethinyl estradiol and levonorgestrel both contain these two agents now ethinyl estradiol is how much one a uh, fifth sorry it is a tatty it is tatty m c g tatty micrograms will be there and Levon or gestrel is zero point one five mg. Okay, so zero point one five mg of levon or gestrel and thirty mcg of ethinyl estradiol are present in mala D and mala N. Now important point is which of the following oral contraceptive pill is a free of cost? Mala N is a free of cost. okay so mala d it's almost 2 rupees now after this iron pills in contraceptive pills okay iron pills in oral contraceptive pills are ferrous fumarate so iron is in which form ferrous fuma rate so usually in oral contraceptive pills seven pills are only iron pills that is ferrous fumarate okay very very important this point ferrous fumarate form now dmpa what is meant by dmpa guys dipot medroxy a progesterone acetate so dmpa is given okay it's a injectable progesterones okay these are injectable progesterones which will cause which can be used as a contraceptives so dmpa is given every 3 months okay once in 3 months okay this is the important point you have to keep in mind dipot medroxy progesterone acetate is given once in 3 months which is a injectable progesterones okay now after this let's continue with the uterine fibroids okay students now let's continue with the topic of uterine fibroids what are fibroids fibroids are benign tumors in the uterus now fibroids are most common pelvic tumors in a female so what are the most common pelvic tumors guys they are fibroids so let's write fibroids are most common pelvic tumors in female okay now most common presentation of fibroids guys please remember in most of the cases these fibroids are asymptomatic okay okay no symptoms at all even the the female if she have fibroids she won't have any symptoms but if she have symptoms most common symptom of a fibroid is then it is meno
ओके मेनोरेजिया मेनोरेजिया इज द मोस्ट कॉमन सिम्टम ऑफ फाइब्रॉइड दैट इज एक्सेसिव ब्लीडिंग नाउ मोस्ट कॉमन यूट्राइन फाइब्रॉइड इज गाइज देर आर डिफरेंट टाइप्स ऑफ फाइब्रॉइड बेस्ड ऑन इट्स लोकेशन यू कैन हैव सब म्यूकस फाइब्रॉइड आर इंट्राम्यूरल फाइब्रॉइड आर सबसीरस फाइब्रॉइड आर लाइक नो डिफरेंट डिफरेंट फाइब्रॉइड्स आर देर बट मोस्ट कॉमन यूट्राइन फाइब्रॉइड इज इंट्राम्यूरल intramural okay intramural in the sense present within the wall of the uterus okay now all fibroids start as first of all all the fibroids they start their life as a intramural fibroid and they can either change into submucosal or subserosal or whatever so to start with all fibroids start as intra mural masses okay all are intramural fibroids at first now fibroids with maximum symptoms which fibroid causes a maximum symptoms then it is sub muco cell means inside the uterus okay not in the wall it's coming nearer to the uterine cavity sub mucosal fibroids have maximum symptoms and these submucosal fibroids very important point these submucosal fibroids can change into malignant transformation so if they ask you which fibroids can have a malignant transformation it is submucosal fibroids okay so most common fibroid to undergo malignant changes sub muco cell of fibroid okay now and the same submucosal fibroids as they are locating near to the uterine cavity they won't allow the fetus to grow so they will cause abortions so fibroids which lead to maximum abortions are also sub muco cell fibroids okay now torsions are seen in which a fibroids can undergo a torsion see if they want to undergo torsion they need to have a stalk that is known as a pedunculated so pedunculated fibroids can undergo a torsion so torsions are seen in pedunculated subserous fibroid okay so pedunculated are the fibroids with stalk they can undergo a torsion now parasitic fibroid are wandering fibroids are so as they are having like you know like subserous fibroids which are outside the uterus now they can dangle over and they can you know grow and they can like you know just like a parasite they are invading so parasitic fibroids are the wandering fibroids are subserous fibroids okay which are growing the outside to the uterus now urinary retention is seen with first of all they can ask you this thing urinary symptoms either urinary retention or urinary frequency is associated with cervical fibroids okay fibroids which are occurring at the region of cervix now please remember urinary retention is associated with cervical but posterior cervical fibroids fibroids which are present a posterior wall of the cervix okay so posterior cervical fibroids posterior cervical fibroids are associated with the urinary retention anterior cervical fibroids are associated with urinary frequency okay now inversion is seen in inversion is means like you know inversion means you uh, try an inversion okay so usually uterus is something like this now you try an inversion means happen something like this so the fundus is coming down 
means if you put a mass if you put a large load at this region to the fundus now that will come down something like this so fundal fibroids okay fundal fibroids fibroids at the region of the fundus so fundal fibroids they will cause uterine inversion okay now inversion is seen in fundal fibroids okay fundal fibroids now most common type of degeneration of the fibroids guys please remember due to the decreased blood supply these fibroids they will undergo degeneration now what is the most common type of degeneration that is hyaline degeneration okay so hyaline degeneration very very important mcq hyaline degeneration is the most common degeneration of fibroids now most common fibroid to undergo calcareous degeneration now this is one more variant of degeneration here the most common fibroid which is undergoing calcareous degeneration is subserous okay subserous fibroid can you remember any other point about subserous fibroid subserous fibroid they are wandering or parasitic subserous fibroid with peduncle they will undergo torsion okay now investigation of choice of these fibroids the investigation of choice is ultra sonography okay now polycythemia is seen in which fibroids guys please concentrate here i have already given so it is a note okay note point guys please concentrate usually because of the fibroids the female is going to have excessive bleeding menorrhagia so excessive bleeding female will have anemia usually fibroids will cause anemia but those females who are having fibroids in the broad ligament they are having they are associated with the polycythemia so which fibroids causes polycythemia guys they are broad ligament fibroids after this now let's continue to discuss about the topic of infertility now let's continue with the topic of infertility first investigation done in infertility is guys all the time remember now we will first examine a male okay so if a couple comes with the problem of infertility we will examine male first okay so first investigation done in infertility is semen analysis okay semen analysis now according to who criteria there are certain important points there are certain important criteria are there for a normal semen so what are they so semen analysis first important mcq and repeated mcq in our fmj exams is volume so what should be the volume of semen it is at least more than or equal to a 1.5 ml okay so 1.5 ml of semen should be ejaculated okay now sperm concentration in that the sperm concentration is a 15 more than a 15 million okay more than 15 million sperms should be present per ml next total sperm count total sperm count means the total amount of sperms present in the ejaculate in the total ejaculate what is the concentration of the sperms so that is the total sperm count so it should be a 39 million per ejaculate okay so in one in one ejaculation there should be a total of a more than or equal to 39 million sperms next motility now total motility see motility means the sperms are moving moving around now the total motility should be at least a 40 a percent okay the total motility should be at least 42% 40% out of which progressively motile sperms are at least a 32% sperms 
okay so total motility of the sperms is 40 percent progressively motile sperms should be at least 32 percent now morphology this is the most important who criteria or most important criteria in the semen analysis is morphology now at least 4 percent of the sperms should have the normal morphology okay with their proper head neck tail okay now leukocytes leukocytes in the semen should be less than 1 million okay so leukocyte should be less than 1 million what about viability viability means living at least 58 percent of the sperms should be living so they will directly they will ask you direct mcqs okay so what should be the total sperm count the total sperm count is 39 million per ejaculate what is the minimum semen that should be released per ejaculate that is the volume of semen is 1.5 ml okay so direct questions they will ask in our exams after that let's see certain important terminology what does it mean by oligojuspermia oligojuspermia means less number of sperms okay less number of sperms that is less than 20 million okay so less number of sperms that is less than 20 million sperms are present then it is known as oligojuspermia now what does it mean by asthenozoospermia asthenozoospermia means sperms not moving okay sperms which are not able to move properly that is asthenozoospermia astheno means weak okay so sperms which are unable to move next teratozoospermia what does it mean by teratozoospermia it means abnormal morphology of sperms abnormal morphology of sperms okay abnormal forms of sperms are there Ejuspermia and Aspermia are very very important terminology okay lot of students will confuse with this what does it mean by Ezuspermia Ezuspermia means no sperms in semen okay there are no sperms seen in the semen what does it mean by Aspermia no semen at all failure of ejaculation aspermia means no semen okay failure to ejaculate now sperms attain maturity in repeated mcq that is epi epididymis epididymis is the part where sperms nurture and they attains their motility okay blood testicular barrier is formed by which cells blood testicular barrier is formed by a special type of cells known as sertoli cells due to the tight junction between these sertoli cells they won't allow the toxic materials into the testis now best blood testicular barrier is formed by a sertoli cells okay a very very important mcq next Ferning of cervical mucus. Ferning of cervical mucus is known as spin barcate sign. Okay, so ferning of a cervical mucus. This is known as spin barcate sign, and this spin barcate sign is because of estrogens. Okay, so this spin bucketing or ferning of cervical mucus is because of estrogens. That means spin bucketing of cervical mucus is seen in the proliferatory stage of menstrual cycle. Why? Because in the proliferatory stage, 
we have estrogens so in secretory phase of menstrual cycle estrogens are less in quantity and we have progesterones so during secretory phase or luteal phase there is no spin bracketing or forming of cervical mucus after this let's see chances of multiple pregnancy with human menopausal gonadotropin see guys please concentrate it is human menopausal gonadotropin in a female who is having in her menopause okay a female is having in her menopause which means there are no estrogens in her body if there are no estrogens in her body what about the negative feedback of estrogen on the pituitary gland usually estrogens will give the negative feedback on the pituitary gland for the release of fsh so if whenever there is no estrogens the negative feedback on pituitary is gone so there is high amount of fsh is present in the postmenopausal female blood and this fsh see fsh is a gonadotropin this fsh is going to be excreted in the urine also now we have extracted this fsh from the urine of postmenopausal women now we can use the same fsh for stimulating the ovaries in a female with infertility okay why because fsh is follicle stimulating hormone so human menopausal gonadotropin is nothing but fsh fsh collected from the urine of a post menopausal woman now this fsh is a very potent fsh now if you are using this human menopausal gonadotropin for ovulation induction it can cause hyper stimulation and leads to multiple pregnancies okay this fsh is powerfully stimulating the ovaries so that not only a one ovum is released but many ova are released that can cause multiple pregnancies so the chances of multiple pregnancy with this human menopausal gonadotropin is a very important mcq that is 30% okay now drug of choice for ovulation induction is now guys please remember previously we used to say like this drug of choice for ovulation induction is clomiphene citrate but there is a recent advance meant that these days we are using letrozole 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 which is a aromatase inhibitor okay so this letrozole is a aromatase inhibitor these days we are using letrozole for the ovulation induction so drug of choice for ovulation induction is not clomiphene citrate but letrozole next tests done for ovarian reserve what does it mean by ovarian reserve we just want to confirm ourselves how many number of follicles are present in the ovaries does these ovaries have a reserve follicles or not okay now test done test done for ovarian reserve are fsh levels okay serum fsh levels is one test a second test which we can do is serum inhibin levels inhibin b levels okay next we can do clomiphene citrate challenge test anti mullerian hormone levels okay anti mullerian hormone levels and antral follicular counting okay so all these 1 2 3 4 5 these five tests are used for knowing the ovarian reserve but most important points are the best test to know the the best test okay to know the 
ovarian reserve is anti mullerian hormone levels okay so this is the uh, best qualitative test okay antral follicular counting is a quantitative test we are counting the number of follicles so antral follicular counting is quantitative see the quantity quantitative test and the best qualitative test is checking the anti mullerian hormone levels okay so they can ask the question like this okay all of the following are the test used for the used for knowing ovarian reserve except so you should know these five tests okay now diagnostic of premature ovarian failure is guys remember usually if ovaries are normal please think like this if ovaries are normal in the growing ovaries follicles are getting matured and these follicles they will produce the estrogen and this estrogen will give the negative feedback for the fsh for example if there is ovarian failure okay ovarian failure now during ovarian failure there are no follicles growing if the no follicles if they are not growing there is no estrogen and if there is no estrogen there is no negative feedback on fsh so in a patient with ovarian failure what happens there is high amounts of fsh releasing so in a female who is almost 25 to 35 years age for example like that so in that female ovary should be functioning but if there is a failure of her ovaries then it is known as a premature ovarian failure so what is the diagnostic for this so premature ovarian failure diagnostic is increased levels of fsh okay increased levels of increased levels of fsh more than 40 international units per ml so this is the diagnostic for premature ovarian failure okay now best test for ovarian reserve is we have already seen that is anti mullerian hormone levels now investigation of choice for tubal patency is guys here it was pregnancy no it, it, was, it was a typing mistake it is patency okay so investigation of choice for tubal patency is we just want to know whether the tubes are perfectly normal or not whether they have any blocks or not okay so investigation of choice is, is hystero salpingo graphy okay hystero salpingo graphy is the investigation of choice a very very important mcq you are going to put the die okay gold standard for tubal patency is the gold standard for tubal patency is laparoscopic chromo pertubation okay laparoscopic chromo pertubation is the gold standard for tubal patency most common cause of bilateral tubal block okay bilateral tubal block the two bilateral conval tubal block don't think that it is because of genital tb but it is because of physiological reasons okay physiologic spasm so physiologic spasm of the cornua you know the place where fallopian tubes attach to the cornua that is the region known as cornua so most common cause of bilateral tubal block that to the especially the region of cornua is physiological spasm okay now a female present with the infertility and she is having bilateral tubal block at the cornua what is the best method of management so how you have to manage her this is a two times repeated mcq in the pg exams so what is the best method of management here it is hysteroscopy with laparoscopy okay so hysteroscopy with laparoscopy hysterolap is the best method of management for a female who is having infertility because of tubal blocks now 
intra uterine insemination means so in the uterus we are inseminating intra uterine insemination means implantation of that is we are implanting the semen with semen implantation of washed a processed a semen in uterine cavity okay this is intrauterine insemination now fallopian tube dysmotility is seen in which syndrome guys remember the fertilization is going to happen in the ampulla and this product of conception should have to reach the uterine cavity it's not just the beating of cilia who brings this product of conceptors into the uterine cavity but the most important factor which helps in the movement of this product of conception into the uterine cavity is the peristaltic movements of fallopian tubes so the peristaltic movements of fallopian tubes are the major are the major ones which are sweeping the product of conception into the uterine cavity but also cilia they will bend and they will you know they will beat and move the product of conception but it is a minor action okay well and good but just now come to the our topic fallopian tube dysmotility means not proper motility is seen in which syndrome that is carta jenner syndrome where there is problem in the you know dynein arms okay carta jenner syndrome why because there is problem with the dynein arm so that the cilia they, they cannot properly beat so that there might be chance that there is infertility usually not seen but there is a chance but remember the major mechanism by which the product of conception from the fallopian tube reaches the uterine cavity is due to peristaltic movements of fallopian tube not just because of ciliary beating okay now post coital test or sims test is done for now this post coital test is done for the interaction of the sperms with the cervical mucus okay interaction of sperms with a cervical mucus or cervical to test cervical hostility okay cervical hostility or the other name is cervical receptivity okay how the cervix is receiving the sperm like you know there, there might be a chance that in the cervix there are anti sperm antibodies so this and all will be known by doing the post coital test also known as sims test okay important very important mcqs please keep in mind luteal phase defect is because of guys remember in the menstrual cycle we have two phases the proliferative phase is also known as follicular phase the other half of the menstrual cycle is luteal phase or secretory phase this luteal phase is because of corpus luteum this corpus luteum is making progesterones and those progesterones are bringing out the secretory changes in the uterine endometrium here luteal phase defect is due to luteal phase is because of progesterone which brings the secretory changes so luteal phase defects are due to a decrease progesterones okay so decrease progesterones whatever might be the reason can lead to luteal phase defect okay guys we have completed the topic of infertility not the topic important points about the infertility now let's see important points about the polycystic ovarian syndrome okay very important topic you can expect at least one mcq in every exam okay so PCOS polycystic ovarian syndrome is the most common cause of is the most common cause of an ovulatory infertility as well as guys remember 
most common cause of hirsutism in a young female is idiopathic but most common cause of pathological hirsutism in young female is because of pcos so most common cause of most common pathological okay please remember most common pathological cause of hirsutism in young female he is also pcos polycystic ovarian syndrome this polycystic ovarian syndrome is also known as steen leventhal syndrome okay just keep that point in mind so what is the criteria used for the diagnosis of pcos the criteria used is amsel's criteria no where do we have used amsel's criteria bacterial vaginosis okay don't forget now here the criteria used for diagnosis of pcos is rotterdam's criteria okay rotterdam's criteria is used for pcos okay at least two out of three criteria should be met okay what are those criteria so rotterdam's criteria include see what are these three criteria i am just writing so that it will be clear oligomenorrhea okay or amenorrhea oligomenorrhea or amenorrhea as well plus hirsutism in the form of hyperandrogenism okay hyper androgenism leading to hirsutism oligomenorrhea or amenorrhea and radiological findings like radiologically radiologically there should be polycystic ovaries okay polycystic ovaries giving string of pearl appearance okay the three criteria under rotterdam's they are oligomenorrhea or amenorrhea hyperandrogenism and radiological finding of polycystic ovaries giving the string of pearls appearance okay at least two out of three criteria should be met to for the diagnosis of polycystic ovarian syndrome yeah here i have already given polycystic ovarian syndrome criteria includes these three okay i have already discussed now key hormonal abnormality in pcos is it is high levels of lh okay this is the main important point now the key hormonal abnormality in pcos is elevated levels of luteinizing hormone and this elevated levels of luteinizing hormone will stimulate the theca internocells and it will cause increased levels of androgens okay and this androgens are the cause of hyperandrogenism but one important point is the main abnormality is high lh levels or elevated lh levels now hormones increased in pcos which hormones are increased and which hormones are decreased this is a very important topic hormone increase in pcos are first of all we know androgens are more first of all let's write let's first of all lh is more okay elevated lh okay well and good one two androgens next estrogens especially estron okay next insulin next ldl ldl cholesterol and sometimes there is increased levels of pro lactin okay so these are the hormones which are increased in pcos now let's see what are the hormones decreased in pcos the hormones which are decreased in pcos are i am writing here okay please concentrate decreased hormones are fsh progesterone pro just tiron are decreased hdl cholesterol is decreased sex hormone 
binding globulins shbg sex hormone binding globulins these are decreased so guys it's very very important you have to know okay what are the hormones increased what are the hormones are decreased okay now let's continue so fsh lh ratio in pcos is guys please concentrate usually normally fsh lh ratio normally is a 2 is to 1 but in pcos lh is more than the fsh so there is the reversal of fsh lh ratio it is going to become 1 is to 2 in pcos okay now syndromes associated with pcos two important syndromes most of you guys will know it what are they they are hair and h a i r hair and syndrome hair and syndrome what does it mean by hair and syndrome in pcos the patient will have hyperandrogenism insulin resistance that's the that's the reason why there is too much amount of insulin and acanthosis nigricans okay dark velvety velvety patch like dark velvety a discoloration over the area of pruras okay so heran syndrome and metabolic x a syndrome okay metabolic x syndrome these are the two syndromes associated with pcos now drug of choice for insulin resistance in pcos what is the drug of choice for insulin resistance it is met formin okay met formin a very important mcq drug of choice for hirsutism drug of choice for hirsutism is oral contraceptive pills with ciproteron acetate okay ciproteron acetate ocps along with the ciproteron acetate is the drug of choice for treating hirsutism guys can you remember what is the what is the scoring what is the scoring system for hirsutism ferry ferryman galway scoring okay ferryman galway scoring is the scoring system for the hirsutism you okay, keep that point in mind most common cause of rapid onset hirsutism see most common cause of hirsutism in a, a young female is idiopathic most common cause of pathological hirsutism or most common pathological cause of hirsutism is pcos but if they mention this word rapid onset rapidly rapid onset hirsutism in a young female is because of testosterone producing a tumors okay guys we have completed most of the topics in gynecology what and all related for fmg those topics we have already completed and gynecological oncology we'll be discussing in a separate video apart from that we will also make a video okay rapid revision video on obstetric part also thank you